I think we should just get started. I see, um, I see right now um, uh, attendees are inching in, uh, at least in the United States, it's still very early and I'm in the East Coast area and uh, it's eight o'clock and the Californian colleagues are still sleeping. So I will get started. First of all, let me uh, share the screen with all of you. I will set it up and speakers, I will not be able to see you because I'm minimizing the picture. Can you all see me okay? Yes. Good. Good morning, uh, welcome again. And you are at the webinar uh, presented by IFLA Academic and Research Library section. And uh, today this webinar is very special and you will know when you listen to the speakers. And um, uh, I wanted to just do some very quick housekeeping and for the library profession, the privacy is very important. And I wanted to let you know here are the privacy information. Uh, the talk is GDPR compliant and uh, IFLA and Zoom privacy policies can be found at the link listed. And if you have questions about privacy, you have this uh, email that you can send to. And for many of the colleagues who are interested in the event, the event is recorded and typically we will post it at this link a week or two after today. Your microphones have been uh, muted uh, for this event so we can um, uh, uh, listen to each other uh, more quietly. And the questions or comments, please type into chat and Q&A box. And uh, I have a committee member uh, monitoring that space. So today is the first time that we are, in, we are experimenting with a machine translation tool. Our last speaker will be presenting in German and we will use that tool, which is called Wordly to translate his voice into text. We have not done this before. We tested it. Hopefully uh, it will uh, work well. Please remember, Wordly does not work with Internet Explorer. Between now and his presentation, if you don't have uh, uh, another browser, you need to install one. So um, at this point, uh, I'm going to turn it to our chair, Gaoshan, to um, introduce the speakers to you. Gaoshan, over to you. Thank you, Shun. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, I'm Yulchen Kriv. I'm the chair of IFLA Academic and Research Library section. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. For me, it's 11 p.m. at night from the east coast of Australia, Byron Bay. So welcome to IFLA Academic and Research Library's webinar series, Tales of Rising from the Ashes rebuilding libraries, museums after a disaster. What an amazing topic. I'm, because I'm speaking to you from Australia, I'd like to start by saying, I'm going to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I am speaking to you today and pay my respects for their elders past and present. Before I introduce our speakers, and there are wonderful speakers tonight, very special speakers from all over the world, I'd like to share a few things about IFLA's academic and research library section, what we do and who we are. Is this webinar is a part of a series of webinars organized and brought to you by members of our section who are all volunteers from all over the world. IFLA's ARL section is a truly global team of dedicated, committed, and passionate library professionals. We have members from all the way from Mexico to New Zealand. It's almost like the sun never sets on IFLA ARL. We are very active, inclusive, and diverse. We have been recognized for our dynamism 
and impact in the recent IFLA Dynamic Unit and Impact Award for 2021. We have a monthly blog, very popular social media presence, webinar series such as this one, amongst many other initiatives. Our webinars are always recorded and made available on YouTube. As Shin said, we will announce the link of the recording uh, in a few weeks' time. We offer travel grants to attend World Library Congress to library workers from Africa, Latin America, and Asia, generously sponsored by Sage and Exlibris. So please follow us on Facebook and Twitter and our web page. I'm not going to read the abstract of tonight's amazingly special webinar because it's already on our website. We have a limited time, but it all started on the 18th of April, 2021. I'm sure Ujala remembers it very well because a runaway wildfire engulfed the University of Cape Town's Jagger Reading Room. So we have panelists who are from all over the world, as I said, and I'm going to say a few words about each one of them. I'm sorry, I'm not going to read all of your bios because we're going to put them all up on our website. Our first speaker, Ujala Satkur, she's the Executive Director of University of Cape Town. She's been there since 2019. She has over 25 years of experience. She has fulfilled a leadership role in many national and international library and information science advisory and governing boards and committees during her career. She was named the first LIASA Executive Librarian of the Year in 2018. Our second speaker hails from Brazil, Maria Bonas. She's a bachelor graduated historian, specialist in museology, and has a master's degree in social museology. She's worked over 20 years in the museum area, focusing, focusing on research, curatorship, collaborative projects, management in the subject of museums. Our third speaker is Dr. Okanlavan Adeji. Dr. Adeji was the former, is the former university librarian of the Federal University Nudufu Alike Ikwa, now known as Alex Akuma Federal University Nudufu Alika Ikwa in Ebony State, Nigeria. I'm, I apologize for my pronunciation. <laughs> Prior to the appointment, he was a visiting librarian and later on sabbatical in the same university between 2013 and 2015. Dr. Adeji has over 40 years of library experience. It spanned all facets of academic librarianship. He retired from service in October, 2020. Our fourth speaker is Madam Jelnar Atui Saad. Madam Saad is the executive director of Lebanese National Library in Lebanon. She's been there since 2018. She's also been with the Ministry of Culture in Lebanon. As you know, Lebanon experienced an explosion disaster uh, a couple of years ago, and it was incredible, and we all felt for it. So we're going to hear from Madame Saad about this disaster. Our final speaker is Mr. Engelbert Schroeder. He's part of the professional fire brigade of the city of Cologne in Germany. We've never had someone from the professional fire brigade on our webinars before, so this is a first. And not only that, as Shin said, his speech is going to be in German, but it will be translated by artificial intelligence. And Dr. Schroeder is actually trained as a consultant in psychotraumatology, certified by the German speaking society for psychotraumatology. Um, before I hand over, I'd like to mention a few names. I'd like to first of all acknowledge our wonderful Xin Li from Cornell University, and she's the main driver behind tonight's webinar. It's been coming a long time. And uh, we have Sive from University of Cape Town assisting Shin, of course, Reggie from 
uh, University, uh, sorry, Stilibe is from Stellenbosch, and uh, Regi is from Cape Town, all South Africa. And uh, we have other members of our AIL team who assisted a lot with the organization of tonight's uh, webinar. Ursula, Toon, Jay Shri, of course, all of our speakers, but I must also acknowledge Sean Taylor from Cornell University, who has been assisting us with technology. Thank you, Sean. And we will also have help tonight from Ms. Lisa Henke, a colleague of our speaker, Mr. Schroeder. Ms. Henke will translate, uh, she's translated Mr. Schroeder's bi biography from German into English, and he's, she's here to assist Mr. Schroeder with the uh, uh, with the question and answer. I won't take any more of your time. I'm just delighted that this webinar has been made possible. It's a very special webinar. So over to you, Shin. Thank you. Thank you, Goshen. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker. Ujala, over to you. Uchala, are you there? Ben, can you hear me? Um, I hear you very faintly. Can you speak louder? Okay. All right. Try it again. Um, Ujala, I can barely hear you. Can the rest of you hear her? No. No, no the, the mic volume no, no. is really, really low. Yeah. I, you were okay in the beginning. No idea what has happened. Oh, it's, it's getting better. Okay. Can you hear me now? Great. Okay. I'm going okay. to mute, mute myself. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much for this opportunity and warm greetings from Cape Town. Um, so thank you very much for being here with us this evening. In next slide. The 18th of April for us is an indelible memory, as mentioned by Goodwin, which is a day that I will never forget because it was the worst nightmare that any library director could imagine. Um, in 2012, the picture on the left, you see a beautiful refurbished image of the Jagger Library. And this was what people were comfortable and familiar with up until the morning of the 18th of April. And coincidentally, we were able to get a photograph of almost the same angle that shows you the scale of the destruction of this really marvelous um, library that we, we were very, very familiar with. I call this an elemental experience because whilst we had fire gutting the reading room, the water that was used to put out this fire resulted in the, the flooding of the basements thereafter. And so what, is, what has actually happened was two elemental experience, two disasters emanating of a freak of nature. And so to put things into perspective, I, I just want to touch on what was lost to fire. That includes the entire reading room and 
in this particular reading room, we had three very significant collections that were held here. And the first was the African Studies Collection, of which a sizable percentage was lost. This was a unique collection that was started in the early 1950s. Um, a second very unique collection was the African Films Collection, which was a parallel um, cinematography commentary on, on cinema in, on the continent. And this was in response to the depiction of Africa and the African in mainstream cinema. So this was a, a collection that reflected the development of cinema throughout the continent. And of course, a significant part of our Southern African collections, which we have um, of considerable countries on these areas. And what was damaged by water was a separate audio and a film collection, which was compiled by several photojournalists of apartheid and struggles, not only in South Africa, but neighboring countries in southern africa and i've just listed some of the items that were also um, damaged um, next slide. Um, in terms of uh, statistics and how we we achieve salvaging our content from the basements at a glance was we have got over 10,000 items in cold storage at the moment because of the extent of water damage. Over close on to 13,000 crates were used to remove materials, but this was truly an exercise in human spirit and resilience. We had over 2,000 volunteers who, who actually supported us in removing these items. And it took us 17 days to remove materials from the basement. We housed the materials in eight different locations, including four um, storage containers, two for dry and two for wet materials, cold storage. But most importantly was the fact that we a COVID lockdown environment, and we were able to register a, a clean and a safe um, experience. No test, no positive cases of COVID were declared. Next slide. Excuse me, uh, Ujala, your sound still comes in and out. The audience said it's problematic for them. Is Do you have a microphone that you're wearing? I adjust? do have a microphone, and this is the, 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 the issue. I can't seem to understand why. Yeah. It's not. Okay, try again. Uh, just, uh, just be aware that it's coming in and out, and that's what the audience is saying. I'm going oh, to unmute yourself. You, you continue, please. Sorry to interrupt sorry. you. Okay. Um, what we have done is adopted a systems approach for reconciling all our losses and for insurance purposes, et cetera. And I, I, I've listed our different systems that we've used to, to compile a fairly comprehensive financial report for our, our insurance claim. But also, it, I think it's a testimony to our librarians who are very fastidious about record keeping, etc. So in, in, in keeping with a brief about lessons learned, I've listed a whole host of lessons, but the most important I would like to share with the colleagues is time of the essence and bring in the expert. We, we do not have all the capabilities in terms of salvaging, preservation and conservation, as well as project management. See it as part of a bigger picture of how to salvage and recover. Next slide. 
And the other lesson that I would like to share with colleagues is how do you leverage this moment? It is a time when you as a library director or an institution are receiving a lot of attention. So how do you actually leverage this moment to engage, to, to engage further around sponsorships, collaborations, etc. And so going forward, we, we, we will be engaging in a whole redefinition, reimagining, repurposing, and reinvigorating project that has already commenced. But underpinning all of this is a resilience to continue in the face of all the destruction Thank you very much, Ujala. Hello, good morning. Good afternoon, good evening. I don't know if you can see me or you can yes, hear me. Yes, we can. Okay. You're Perfect. good to go. So thank you for the, for the invitation. It's my first presentation about this, the recovering of the, the Museum of the Portuguese Language. So next slide, please. And next slide again. So the Museum of the Portuguese Language, we inaugurated in 2006, and we received it more than 4 million visitors throughout 10 years. And we received a lot of a lot of indications, awards about uh, the innovative uh, proposed innovative approach of the museum is a museum devoted to the Portuguese language as any material uh, heritage and with and we use since 2006 a lot of technology and we can go to the next slide. And then, unfortunately, in 2000, December, in 2015, in December, we had this terrible and huge fire. The museum is sited, is located in a historical building of uh, Estação da Luz, that is like, it's a historical building from the beginning of the, the 20s, the 20th century. And the fire destroyed half of the building, mostly the museum part of the building because the, the station is still working. And it's the next, this is the second fire of the station. The first one, it was in 1950s, but this one started in the temporary exhibition room of the museum. And it was a tragic, fire and took six years to restore and recover the building. Unfortunately, one of the firemen uh, lost his life trying to save one of the part of the, the exhibition. And so we had, we had a loss on, on our team. And well, this is a, a, a historical building, but in the other hand, we didn't have any objects because it, it was like a museum completely, uh, completely devoted to immaterial content. And so we had a lot of, of technology and we didn't have museological objects. So the loss, the main loss, of course, is this. Ronaldo's life that was the fireman and of course the the loss of half of the building that we could reconstruct so we had since 2016 we started the restoration first the facades and frames and then the roof and interiors we can go to the next slide some of the the images of the scale of the fire and then this is 
this is a place in Sao Paulo here in Brazil that we had a lot of historical buildings and a lot of museums. And we were really luck in the other hand, because it was a Monday. So the museum was closed and we had only the staff that it was like a, a really tiny part of the staff that was working. So all the scale of the loss was really, was really uh, less, uh, how can I say, less, less terrible that could be, uh, even with the scale of this loss of the building. And of course, the loss of one out. And we can go to the next slide. And then we started, you can see the main hall at left. That is the, the, the station, the railroad station. And we use this, the first floor of the building. And then we can go to the next slide also. So the restoration took this, the beginning of the rest, all the projects and all the, the, the projects to recover these, to find money and funds to recover took like two years. And the reconstruction began in July 18. And in this August of this year, we opened, reopened the museum. We can go to the next slide. And so these, this was the place that originally now recovered the region originally cited the so the focus of the fire and it was in a really tiny spark of electrical device and then then started the fire in an installation a scenography uh, of a temporary exhibition so it was really really a, a terrible accident and even if we had the, the fire projects and all, all the things, it was really spread really quickly. And then now to the recovery and the restoration, we have a really secure system of, of protection. So we can go to the next slide. So this is the main exhibition that was all, also recovered. We can go to the next slide also. It's really a lot of slides about this process of recovering. This is the main, uh, the main floor. So we can, all, all the tiles and all the, the tower, like when we have also a clock, a historical clock. So it was recovered uh, and then an auditorium that also burned in the, the fire. We can go to the next slide. So the main roof, now the terrace. So this is one of the most, uh, most damaged part. So now we have just the terrace after the terrace. So we recovered the building. We can go really quickly to the, to the slides. There's a lot of pictures. So we have this long-term exhibition. We have also a reference center. And we also discuss, we preserve research not just about the Portuguese language, but also about how to avoid uh, and how to protect historical buildings of damage of like we, suff we suffered. We can go to the next also, to the next building. And this is the, the, the next building, sorry, next slide. This is the actual exhibition that we reopened uh, at August now. We can go next slide. And so we have languages of the world, language family. So we present the Portuguese language in these digital devices. We can go to the next slide also. We have the street language. There's like a huge corridor with a lot of projections. We can go to the next. And we have like an, an a little auditorium to present some videos about identities in Brazil. We can go next also. Uh, we have some games, so it's a really interactive uh, exhibition. We can go also next. We have crosswords when we can play about the influence of the Portuguese language. And all this content 
was uh, thankfully was uh, preserved in another building. So we had backup of all this content. And so we could uh, not just uh, to put again, to present again, to review it, but also actualize and guarantee that this digital preservation was the main focus of the preservation, also the museum uh, with the, the, the physical preservation of the building. We can go to the next slide also. And this is like a time a timeline of the Portuguese language history in Brazil. We can go. We have the all the countries that also speak Portuguese in the in the world. So, like a global language. So we have also this new content. We can go to the next. And we have a different, a new, also a new part of the exhibition talking about the different accents of Brazil and the different influences from generations and, and influences like geographical also uh, differences. And we, the, the main thing of the Portuguese language is to, to talk about diversity. So we can go to the next also. And the new auditorium also. Next slide. And we have this main tower that it was really completely destructed by the fire was recovered. And we have a huge projection in the, in the roof of this tower. Um, so all the wood and all the facade were like restored, recovered, and is one of the main attractions of the museum. Language square, we can go next. And now the, the building is also recovered. And this is like some programs. We can go next about our managing museum, but we have a strong, uh, we are really devoted to, to this, the security and conservation of the, the building. And we talk a lot and we have like workshops and we, we in a way, because of what happened with us, we became like a reference to how reconstruct and how to prevent fires. But unfortunately in Brazil in 2018, we had, we had a huge fire at the National Museum also, and the Portuguese Language Museum staff also have, uh, helped the, the National Museum uh, staff to, to organize themselves after uh, the the fire. We can go next. Mrs. Bonas, we need to move on to the next. Yes. Question. Okay. We can. Okay. Yeah. We can. Uh, yeah. I'll do very quickly. Thank you. Okay, but it's just to the this, the last slide. We can go to the last slide. It's the the like yes. These advices I think that also guarantee uh, not not just the safety but also like how to address to, to other levels what's happening with the maintenance of your building. So the needs, and you have to guarantee that everyone knows what's, what can happen in your, in your context. And also keep close relationship with all emergency services. I don't know, but here in Brazil could be really slow, the response, and then to keep them close, to have all the contacts is really key to emergencies like that, but thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Dr. Adadijay, over to you. Hello? Yeah. Uh, Thank you very much for the opportunity, you know, to address the issues that has been uh, rampant these days. Uh, the case of uh, this one is a case of blown off rooftop, which resulted into flooding of the university main library of uh, the Alex Equipment Federal University and Dufu Alike Eko Eifunai. Uh, in Nigeria, uh, the library was under construction since 2012, and uh, because of uh, the exigency of uh, space, 
we had to move in June 2018, you know, though with the uh, 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 endorsement of the management that it was, you know, good enough to take off. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, the disaster really, I mean, what, from what we see, this is really a gory site. Um, this was a case of a blown up roof, as I said. This disaster was preceded by a fast moving one wind um, accompanied by heavy damper of rainstorm, I mean of rain. Uh, and in fact, the university is located about 35 kilometers away from the township on a plain land. And um, when this up started, uh, the whole township of Abakaliki was really ravaged. And in fact, you have almost uh, a, a third of us, the buildings, you know, were deeply affected. So uh, the university library, our university itself uh, was not spared. Um, the, the rainstorm virtually, I mean, virtually uh, caused a disharmony uh, and uh, the, there was nothing uh, anybody could do, particularly the staff on duty. Uh, 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 when it occurred, it was a Saturday night. Uh, they had to scamper. That's, that was from the report, you know, that reached me uh, then, that they had to scamper for safety. Uh, that was uh, that, the event of uh, that day. The second day, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the, second, the second day, uh, the effort was to, we had to quickly uh, meet, that's the library management, and that we visited the place to ascertain or evaluate the extent of uh, destruction and the way, the, the way forward. Uh, but we could not just leave the place without uh, salvaging quite a number of uh, uh, our materials that were threatened, should there be further uh, 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 rain, uh, rain uh, uh, devastating rain. So uh, we mobilized people from the neighborhood. Uh, those are the volunteers, and uh, they really assisted. You know, put this on tables and chairs. Uh, then the next day, which was a Monday, the first working day. Next slide, please. Uh, we the the management intervened because uh, uh, we had, I had to write a report to the uh, notify, officially notifying the management and the management, you know, discussed this extensively at the various uh, meetings. It wasn't only the library that was uh, I mean, affected, it caused across almost all the academic and supporting units uh, structures. Uh, uh, what was really uh, uh, depressing, was the fact that uh, from the direct recommendation of the uh, Works and Services Department, li uh, library was said to be uh, not ha no longer habitable because uh, the structures had been uh, 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 compromised. And uh, that was not too far-fetched because uh, uh, you could see the, 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 this thing hanging, you know, overhead, uh, the noggins. So it wasn't safe for anybody to, uh, to continue to use the facility. Now, uh, the, uh, the slide you are seeing, uh, this was the library before, okay? And uh, uh, we had this uh, seeming uh, imp uh, impression of what the library used to be. Uh, uh, the one on the, the uh, picture top right uh, is the structure that we moved into. The vice chancellor was gracious enough 
reading my report and the recommendation of the uh, uh, works and services that the place is inhabitable, graciously uh, ceded this uh, building to us. The building uh, was to be the uh, computer laboratory of uh, Faculty of Agriculture. And it has to be, it was coming up, uh, it was nearing completion and they had to speed up the uh, completion in order to accommodate us. Uh, be that as it may, that was a, a rescue, uh, but uh, it wasn't adequate. Um, now we had to uh, put the shelves in there and then requested for another, we requested for another uh, space. Uh, which the VC again uh, granted, uh, which accommodated the workrooms and the uh, uh, staff offices and uh, uh, the university librarians uh, office. Uh, I think the most important here now, uh, next slide, is the fact that uh, uh, time was of the essence. Uh, the, uh, you, uh, you could see the damaged uh, uh, books on the floor, uh, uh, the water had, uh, 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 done the worst that could be possible. The, 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 the goal was that we needed to come up fast because students' examination was just around the corner. Uh, was about, uh, I think it was uh, to be in August, July, August. And also the accreditation of about 28 programs uh -huh, by NUC was to uh, later in September. So we were really at the dilemma, what we, shall we uh, 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 pro, uh, produce or showcase as the library? Uh, th 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 there will not be any excuse, you know, uh, granted to us, though uh, we felt that we just have to quickly uh, restore library services. Now, the impact of the disaster, uh, you could see from the picture, there are quite a number of, of the whatever damage to the library collection. Uh, the in, in, uh, collection has at the time of uh, this, uh, um, before the incident, we were close to 21,000 uh, uh, because it's a new, relatively new university. We were close to 21,000 volumes and uh, you can imagine, you know, uh, 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 what it would, it would require of us. That is in terms of volumes of books. We have other resources, you know, to back this up. The e-library and uh, uh, se separately. Uh, uh, that was actually what saved us. But uh, the, for the books, uh, the reference and the serious collections were really, really affected. Uh, from the earlier picture, uh, the reference and the serious collection uh, were really on the ground floor and uh, just directly uh, uh, where the uh, roof opened and uh, the gush was so much that uh, we really could. Now, uh, as part of the action taken, um, I felt that the library collection uh, uh, and the critical or essential library services were fully restored within the shortest possible time frame. That was the goal. And uh, we have to set up two committees under my chairmanship and then headed by, I mean, uh, and the senior staff uh, coordinating each of these, the recovery and restoration committee and the relocation committee. Because the VC had granted us a space, that was the need for the relocation committee. But we initially focused on the recovery and restoration. Uh, these, are the, these were the uh, mandates or the TOR, uh, terms of reference, you know, that were uh, given to them to identify the damaged uh, resources uh, categorize them accordingly, then to determine the, uh, uh, to do proper documentation, prepare each item for restoration, identify re relevant vendors or whatever that could be needed. Next, uh, next slide, please. Um, well, uh, when we moved into the building, to the new temporary library, I think uh, this is what we were able to 
to get. Uh, I th we need to learn one thing here. The speed and the time, I mean, that it took us barely one month to set this up, barely one month to get this place, you know, just like this. Uh, I, I, I myself, I, we, we couldn't believe, and the, we, we, I think the vice chancellor and the university management, you know, uh, appreciated this. Now, uh, well, I think the relocation committee, uh, 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 this is what we have as the mandate for them to look at the modality. Uh, the essence is this, to one, uh, uh, ensure that uh, uh, vital records uh, are protected in the course of, of move, movement and uh, effective movement to ensure minimal loss. And then uh, to do site preparation, uh, 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 there are many things needed to be done. As listed, there are deep cleaning, supervision of all the uh, facilities and uh, to ensure that uh, uh, we move unit by unit in orderly manner uh, through labeling or whatever. Oh, it was perfectly done. I think I commend the two uh, committees. Now, uh, here, it, it's still part of the uh, new uh, temporary uh, library. Next slide. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Ah, okay. I think uh, we have jumped the whatever. It's okay. Uh, one of the lessons, uh, part of the lessons we learned, we will get to the some part of the lessons we learned was to establish faculty libraries quickly. It was in the pipeline, but because, uh, uh, no, sorry, just leave it there. Uh, it was in the pipeline, but because uh, 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 the, the impact of the uh, accident or incident actually fast track the uh, establishment of our council libraries, we had to move some uh, books and journals and shelves because there was no space any longer for them. There. So we quickly established faculty of law, faculty, this is faculty of law, faculty of agree, faculty of education, fac about five or six faculty libraries, you know. I think uh, uh, if not for the accident or disaster, we, uh, we, we, it will have taken longer. For next slide, please. Next slide, please. I will, Dr. DJ, DJ, you need to wrap up within one minute. Thank oh, you. Okay, please go to the last two, uh, the, uh, the last three uh, uh, lessons and other something. Sorry, just, just uh, well, we subscribe to data uh, lessons, you know, library building, uh -huh. uh, this is a prototype. What we had was a prototype for all uh, uh, similar university libraries, you know. So, but we felt that there was an inadequate uh, 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 supervision for us to have a structural defects and that uh, henceforth librarians could be involved in writing of the brief for the designing of uh, good buildings. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh -huh. the other lessons, establishments of a collection redistributed, you know, because of shared spaces. Library policy was quickly drafted, you know, uh, to that effect. And uh, we uh, had to increase our subscription to electronic resources. And uh, what actually happened was we identified the bad ones. If we have those we have on e-resources, we, we left. Those that we did not have on our e-resources, we had to uh, subscribe and uh, repurchase and uh, uh, subscribe for them. Then uh, there is the need for green consideration, you know, for the library building, because that was an open whatever. If there had been buildings that would have served as shield uh, or break wind, uh, to break the wind, uh, I think uh, the impact would not have been uh, that much. Next and the last. Next, please. Aha. Uh -huh. In this part of the world, we normally we prepare for provisions, a fire uh -huh, for uh, fire disaster, but uh, we rarely do you find us, you know, prepared for accident of uh, uh, windstorm or flooding. So there should be big blueprint to guide in such circumstance. This is the new library coming up, okay? So and we hope that uh, it, uh, it will be completed in due course and will be as uh, uh, good as uh, any other library, you know, worldwide. Last, 
I think there's another one, you know. Sorry, I think there's a, oh, I will bounce back. Thank you. Uh, I will just say thank you to the university management that readily seated to all our requests. Then the tertiary uh, education trust fund in Nigeria, uh, uh, funding most of the something because of the regularity of the fund, uh, we were able to uh, quickly uh, get a lot done. And most importantly, I will say this, if not for the resilience and commitment of my staff, and in fact, the man on the left, you know, sustained deep head injury. It was, it had to be stitched, but they all came back to, to work, you know, and uh, that, that, that had uh, that I I impact. So within two months, we bounced back, the services restored, and uh, I hope uh, we're waiting for uh, the new library to be completed. Uh, thank you very much for, for this. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. DJ. So we're moving on to... Bye -bye. Oh, okay, uh, Fiona, can you share screen? I think you made uh, yeah. as the... Okay, I will mute myself. So... Is it okay? I can see you, but I have not seen you share your screen and you should be able to share your screen. Good, we can Go see on. it. Yes, okay. Go ahead. Uh, first of all, I want to apologize because my presentation is in French, <laughs> so uh, I think you didn't have a problem. I, I tried to make the two languages. First of all, I want to, to thank you. This is our uh, Lebanese National Library. I want to thank you to give me the chance to, to participate to this uh, webinar and especially to, uh, to talk about, uh, about our experience after the disaster of the explosion of 4 of August, 2020. Okay. So I want to, to begin to, uh, to talk about some, his, uh, some of the history of the Lebanese National Library. And I want to talk uh, French now. And, uh, I think you didn't have, uh, you have a problem? You hear me? Uh, we hear you okay. Okay. Uh, en 1921, c'est la création de la Bibliothèque Nationale par le Vicomte, Vicomte Philippe de Tarazi et elle était nommée la Grande Bibliothèque de Beyrouth. 1924, c'est la promulgation du loi de dépôt légal. Uh, excuse me. Sorry. So, Gana, are you going to do your translate uh, your yes. uh, presentation may... entirely in French? No, no, no. I, I. Wait. Oh, okay. Sorry, because okay. I. Okay. So, go ahead. I, I, I make the translation. Uh, in 1921, it's the edification of the Lebanese National Library by, by Vicomte Philippe de Tarazi. In 24, it's a legal deposit law. In 19. 37, the National Library uh, take, uh, has a new uh, building in the National Parliament in Beirut. Still there uh, till uh, 1975, the date of the uh, civil war, uh, Lebanese Civil War. From 1940 to 1975, the, uh, uh, the National Library will be in the, in the good level. After in 1975, the civil wars in the, the downtown of Beirut make some uh, make a big and huge damage to the Lebanese National Library and his collection. And some very uh, and very precious manuscript and document will be disappeared in this moment. And after in 1979, the Lebanese National Library it's uh, it's uh, closed. 
and the all the collection will be, uh, they will be, uh, they will be transferred to many and many places during many years and after many years of uh, uh, of trying to uh, rehabilitate to, to make a rehabilitation of the Lebanese national library in 2003 the union european union that uh, gave us a, a donation for three years to make the rehabilitation pro project of Lebanese National Library. And in 2005, we, we take a donation from, uh, from the state of Qatar from 25 million of dollars to, to the construction of the Lebanese, uh, of the building of the National Library. It's an old building and from the Ottoman uh, period, okay? Not Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay. Okay, now you have half of your time. Sorry. I I have some uh, in, the, in the internet connection. Okay, in two thousand seven, we make uh, the re uh, uh, revival project of Lebanese National Library with the all uh, of the budget and everything from the Lebanese. Uh, from the Lebanese uh, budget, okay. In 2017, find it's the ending of the the ending of the construction of the new building, and for December 2018, it's the big opening for for the Lebanese National Library, and it's the we begin to receive uh, to receive visitors and uh, to, to present our documentary services and everything uh, in this moment. I try to show you some of the new building. It's a old building, but it's, uh, it's, it, there is an extension and uh, that will, will be restored. This is the... But after, in October 2019, there is uh, a uh, some manifestation, uh, political manifestation uh, in Lebanon, and there is the, uh, the that will be situated behind the Lebanese National Library. So from this uh, date, we take some uh, plan d'urgence, emergency plan to preserve to to make a, a preventive uh, a preventive preservation to the building, to the library, and to the collection. And after, uh, after two or three months, we make some, uh, uh, our uh, precaution and everything. So after two or three months, they uh, that will be covered. And we have to close the, temporarily our uh, library. And after, uh, <laughs> after many months, there is 4 August 2020 explosion of port uh, of, port of Beirut and there is a big uh, damage in our library. So some uh, photos. Can you see? So, so uh, it will be a big damage in the building in, uh, in equipment and electronic system, mechanical, electrical, generator, ACs, external wood doors, fire rated steel partition, including glass, fire rated windows, gypsum fall sailing, fire rated steel door, fire, uh, fire system, access barriers, waterproofing, uh, BMS and servers and many things that will be that will make our building not functional uh, the collection is is uh, is good but because there uh, there was in the underground in the stacks underground so uh, that not will be damaged but the whole building it's in uh, in very bad condition so uh, so we make uh, some uh, emergency plan we take uh, the the collection in the in the reading hall 
that will be uh, placed under uh, under uh, uh, danger and everything. So we take it underground, and uh, we we begin to 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 make our uh, plan to uh, secure to make it secure it to 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 close the doors and wait to close the doors to make to make play wood plastic and everything because of winter because of uh, of uh, we didn't uh, give a access to anybody to enter and to begin a communication with many parts many uh, many organization and institution to have uh, to have uh, uh, our uh, some help to begin to restore again the uh, uh, our uh, building so we we talk with many uh, many institution and organism and uh, and finally we we have now ali foundation qatar foundation and banf that will uh, that will help us to make the uh, re a revival project of lebanese Nas national library again after uh, this many things uh, happened uh, in the last year. So uh, this is uh, some uh, uh, pursue about uh, National Library, Lebanese National Library. Okay. Hello. Yes, that's fabulous. Thank you so much, Ganal. So I'm going to move on to the next speaker and I need to go back to share my screen. So I mentioned in the beginning, our next speaker, Mr. Scherde, will be presenting in German. And this starting now, the audience need to pay attention because it is for you. We will now turn on the Wordly, which is a machine translation tool. And because it's machine translating while listening to Mr. Scherde, it will have a delay before you see the text. You can choose your preferred language the translation won't be perfect. And I mentioned it earlier, Wordly does not work with Internet Explorer. So this is the instruction for the uh, audience uh, to follow. I am going to turn on the, hold down, I'm going to turn on my Wordly. Sean, I don't have that option. I need to be made back to a host. Audience, please be patient. I will let you know. By the way, this is our first time and we are delighted that we can test translation tools. Your host now. I do not see that function. Oh, no, I do. Okay, my system says it's preparing to do a live stream translation. When it's ready, I will let you know. Please remember the translated text is in a browser, not within the Zoom. It should work now. I will give a couple of minutes. Herr Schröder, können Sie bitte ja. ein bisschen Deutsch reden? Dann kann ich, ich kann sehen, versuchen. ob... Ja. Also Deutsch kann ich ganz gut reden. <lacht> ich möchte mal sehen, ob, ob das auf Englisch... Äh ich weiß, alles gut. Ich habe es verstanden. Ja. Sure. Ich hoffe, es funktioniert. Von daher, ähm, 
Ja. Entschuldige mich ja. dafür, dass ich, ich kann halt kein Englisch, das habe ich nie gelernt. Von daher hm, müssen wir das, das Ganze in okay. Deutsch machen. Das ist okay, man sollte auch ja. Deutsch äh, lernen. Ja, muss man nicht unbedingt. Ich hoffe, es funktioniert. Das wäre das Beste. Ja, ja. Ich warte ein bisschen, äh, weil nicht, ähm, man braucht ein bisschen Zeit. Alles gut. Ja, ja. I hope this works for everybody. And if you have problems, please enter in chat. We have 50 participants, so I'm leaving this for one more minute. Good, thank you. I see Gabby said it's working. So far, so good, Karen. Thank you for the feedback. Okay, I think we're going to go into the trans um, presentation part. Um, I'm going to move away. All right, um, over to you, Schröder. Okay, dann dürfen Sie die nächste Folie nehmen. Guten Tag, äh, guten Morgen, guten Tag, und guten Abend zusammen. Ich mache, ich erzähle Ihnen jetzt mal ein bisschen was über den psychologischen Part, was mit Ihren oder was mit den Mitarbeitern, die gerade so ein Erlebnis hinter sich haben, was mit denen tatsächlich oder was mit denen passiert. Ähm, warum ist das wichtig, damit Sie wissen, was kann ich für meine Mitarbeiter tun? Weil ich glaube, die Mitarbeiter sind ihr größtes Potenzial, was sie drin haben. Und da müssen sie halt eben gucken, dass sie die auch wieder eingefangen kriegen, sodass die mit ihnen weiter zusammenarbeiten können. Nächste. Ähm, wir gehen mal so ein bisschen in die Psychotraumatologie. Nächste. Ähm, da geht es erstmal um ein äh, kritisches ähm, Ereignis. Was ist ein kritisches Ereignis? Ein kritisches Ereignis ist grundsätzlich dann zu sehen, wenn, die, ähm, wenn, jemand, und wenn jemand tatsächlich etwas mit seinen Bewältigungsmechanismen tatsächlich überfordert ist. Das heißt, derjenige, der das Ganze erlebt, der kann tatsächlich mit dem, was er gerade sieht, nicht umgehen. Ähm, das Ganze ist vom Grundprinzip her ist das reiner Stress. Wir bewegen uns da im limbischen System in einem Teil, in einem sehr alten Teil. Da geht es dann nur noch um Flucht, Angriff und die Sonderform ist tatsächlich die Erstarrung. Warum ist das wichtig? Das ist für Sie wichtig, um aber auch zu verstehen, wenn Sie Mitarbeiter haben, die entweder erstarren in solch einer Situation, dann wissen Sie, okay, das ist jetzt normal, das ist vollkommen in Ordnung. Aber genauso, wenn Sie Mitarbeiter haben, die laufen gehen, die tatsächlich weglaufen, auch das ist in Ordnung. Wir haben das beim Einsturz Stadterschiff 2009, war das, glaube ich, in Köln, wo wir das erlebt haben. Da sind Leute tatsächlich aus dem Stadterschiff raus, nachdem es eingestürzt ist. Und die sind laufen gegangen, die sind nach Hause gegangen, was dann im Nachhinein tatsächlich auch zu Problemen führte, weil sie können jemand, der auf einmal 500 Kilometer weg ist, den kriegen sie schwerlich betreut. Aber das kommt zum Schluss nochmal. Somit sind, müssen wir gucken, wie wir da tatsächlich drankommen. Ja. Ähm, grundsätzlich haben sie, werden Sie bei Ihren Mitarbeitern äh, Stresssymptome erkennen, die relativ gut sichtbar sind. Dazu gehören ähm, ganz klar ein Zittern, dann haben wir Schwitzen, Rötung, Blässe der Haut, ähm, schnelle Atmung, ja. Unruhe, zielloses Umherlaufen und Pseudohandeln. Das sind so die wichtigsten Sachen, die Sie bei Ihren Mitarbeitern feststellen können. Und auch da muss man sich darüber im Klaren sein, dass das ganz normal ist, eine normale Reaktion von normaler Menschen auf ein unnormales Ereignis. Was Sie nicht 
die Stresssymptome, die Sie tatsächlich selber nicht ganz so gut sehen können, das sind ähm, Herzrasen. Das merken die Leute allerdings selber sehr gut. Äh, eine innere Unruhe, das heißt, die Leute, die merken, hier stimmt irgendwo was nicht, aber ich komme einfach auch nicht weiter. Teilweise haben die Leute Gedächtnisstörungen. Es fehlen ihnen einfach wichtige Sachen. Ähm, die fangen an zu grübeln, ähm, denken über das ganze Ereignis nach, denken darüber nach, wie sie damit umgehen, was muss jetzt noch gemacht werden und so weiter. Und da gibt es auch da gibt es in der ähm, Psychotraumatologie, wenn man in der Literatur nachsieht, gibt es eine ganze Menge weitere Symptome. Aber dann sind wir in der Zeit einfach viel zu kurz. Das reicht einfach nicht. Ähm, wir reden dann tatsächlich über eine akute Belastungsreaktion. Wie gesagt, das ist eine normale Reaktion normaler Menschen auf ein unnormales Ereignis. Sie haben hier, und ähm, darüber muss man sich im Klaren sein, hier gerade im DSM-Bereich gibt es diese akute Belastungsreaktion als Störung, gibt es nicht, also als Diagnose gibt es die nicht mehr. Die akute Belastungsreaktion, also die, die dsm 5 das Diagnostisch-Statistische Manual psychischer Erkrankungen sieht es nicht vor, dass die akute Belastungsreaktion noch diagnostiziert wird. Das ist im europäischen Raum anders. Da gilt die ECD 10 zur Zeit und die sieht das tatsächlich noch vor. Sie dürfen weitermachen. Ja, nochmal. So dass sie dass man in dem Moment auch erklärt oder man hat eingesehen, dass das Ganze tatsächlich eine ganz normale Reaktion von normalen Menschen auf ein unnormales Ereignis ist. Weiter. Sie haben vom Grundprinzip her, haben Sie eine Stressreaktion. Machen Sie mal weiter. Noch eins weiter. Noch eins. Noch eins. Genau. Und Sie haben im Prinzip ein Ereignis, was außerhalb ihres Weltbildes liegt, wo sie im Prinzip tatsächlich nicht mit zurechtkommen, wo sie nicht wissen, was passiert damit. Machen Sie nochmal weiter. Und noch eine. Und sie sind jetzt in den ersten 72 Stunden nach dem Ereignis, reagieren eigentlich jeder anders. Und egal, wie man reagiert, das ist vollkommen in Ordnung. Also derjenige, der laufen geht, also wirklich wegrennt, das ist in Ordnung. Die Erstarrung ist in Ordnung, ist für den späteren Verlauf nicht ganz so günstig. Aber auch die Leute, die anfangen zu arbeiten, zu machen, zu tun, auch das ist in Ordnung. Die Leute bewegen sich tatsächlich in einem Bereich, wo sie ihre eigenen Stresssymptome potenziert hoch 10 erleben sie dann. Das macht den Leuten Angst. Darüber muss man sich im Klaren sein. Das heißt, wenn die diese Stresssymptome auf einmal haben, die wissen gar nicht, wie geht das Ganze jetzt mit mir weiter. Vom Grundprinzip, machen Sie mal eine weiter. Vom Grundprinzip her geht das Ganze, wenn alles gut läuft, in die Verarbeitung rein. Noch eine weiter. Und diese Verarbeitung wird in so einer Wellenbewegung gemacht. Auch das ist immer normal. Das heißt, Sie erleben, die erleben die, das Ereignis nochmal. Die Stresssymptome steigen nochmal. Dann sind die sehr oft hyperaktiv. Dann gehen die Leute, geht das Ganze wieder runter, dass sie eher in eine depressive Phase reinkommen. Und diese Wellensymptomatik oder diese Wellenbewegung ist ganz wichtig für die Verarbeitung. Die dauert unter Umständen ähm, sechs, bis zu sechs bis acht Wochen. Das heißt, in der Zeit kann man ganz gut feststellen, wie geht es den Leuten. Und irgendwann ähm, klingen die Symptome tatsächlich wieder ab. Das Ganze geht in die Erholung rein. Gehen Sie mal zwei Folien weiter. Zwei mal, genau, und noch mal. Und sie sind dann tatsächlich, es ist ein Teil des Lebenslaufes. Sie werden, das ist das, was man den Leuten auch irgendwann versuchen muss, plausibel zu machen. Es wird nicht weggehen, auch die Bilder werden nicht verschwinden. Die Bilder gehören einfach dazu. Die sind vollkommen normal. Gehen Sie noch mal eine weiter. Was können Sie tun? Das ist mal ganz wichtig. Das Wichtigste, was man macht in so einer akuten Phase, ist die Leute tatsächlich aus dem Blickfeld des Ereignisses rausholen. Das heißt, man versucht sie erstmal irgendwo hinzubringen, wo sie keinen Blick auf das Ereignis haben, was da egal, ob die Bibliothek abbrennt, ob sie einstürzt oder egal, was da passiert, 
Man versucht sie erstmal da wegzuholen und rauszuziehen, damit sie eine Chance überhaupt haben, sich tatsächlich ein bisschen zu erholen. Dann macht man im Prinzip, hört man den Leuten im Prinzip nur zu. Das heißt, wir reden, man, man lässt die Leute reden, die möchten ihre Emotionen loswerden, die möchten das, was sie gerade beschäftigt, loslassen. Die wiederholen das unter Umständen immer wieder und das Ganze unter Umständen 25 Mal innerhalb von einer Viertelstunde. Aber das ist okay. Die Leute brauchen das in so einer Situation. Ist ja eine weiter. Was total hilfreich ist, wenn man den Leuten kleine Entscheidungsmöglichkeiten äh, gibt. Also man fragt einfach, hey, wie sieht es aus? Möchten Sie was zu trinken haben? Dann müssen Sie entscheiden, ja, nein. Damit kommen die in der Regel aus der Hilflosigkeit wieder raus und gehen wieder in die eigene Entscheidungsfähigkeit rein. Das heißt, sie fühlen sich nicht mehr hilflos. Und das ist für die Verarbeitung zum späteren Zeitpunkt extrem wichtig, dass man es das auch relativ früh wieder ansetzt. Eine weiter. Das, was man dann machen sollte, wäre den Leuten eine Psychoedukation geben. Das heißt, man erklärt den Leuten tatsächlich nochmal, was passiert ist. Das ist normal, das ist in Ordnung. Das wird sechs bis acht Wochen anhalten. Und dann sollte es eigentlich langsam deutlich besser werden. Und es sollte ihnen eigentlich deutlich, also die Symptome sollten deutlich nachlassen. Und auch ganz wichtig ist, dass man ihnen eine Struktur aufgibt, weil bei vielen Leuten bricht tatsächlich komplette Welt zusammen. Und da brauche ich eine Struktur, damit sie im Anschluss daran tatsächlich auch weiter äh, ihre Arbeit machen können. Und am günstigsten ist, wenn man sie wirklich arbeiten lässt, gegen Abend immer wieder Entlastungsgespräche anbieten. Das heißt, man trifft sich nochmal in der Gruppe, redet miteinander, holt sich jemand dazu, der das Ganze extern moderiert, der dann nochmal guckt, wie geht es euch gerade, was habt ihr erlebt, gibt es irgendwas, was ihr gerade jetzt im Moment braucht. Das führt dazu, dass die Leute über einen langen Zeitraum gut versorgt sind und gut arbeiten können. Ähm, eine weiter. Wichtig ist, wichtig ist einfach, dass jeder Betroffene anders das Ereignis verarbeitet. Jeder braucht seine Zeit und jeder geht ganz anders damit um. Normalerweise verarbeiten die Leute das tatsächlich sehr gut, die meisten. Es gibt einen geringen Teil, weniger brauchen tatsächlich eine therapeutische Hilfe, ein zweiter. Die brauchen eine therapeutische Hilfe und das auch oft nur kurzfristig. Da reichen so fünf, sechs Sitzungen beim Therapeuten um den Verarbeitungsprozess ins Laufen zu kommen. Gehen Sie nochmal weiter. Und ganz wenige brauchen tatsächlich eine längere Therapie. Das werden Sie in der Regel von, also ich sage mal, von zehn Leuten wird es vielleicht einer sein, der zum Schluss tatsächlich eine Therapie braucht. Alle anderen verarbeiten das hervorragend. Ich möchte mal kurz erklären, anhand vom Stadtarchiv beim Einsturz, was haben wir da tatsächlich gemacht. Am ersten Tag ist, aus was für Gründen immer, keine Unterstützung geschehen. Da ist eigentlich gar nichts passiert. Das heißt, es hat mal den schulpsychologischen Dienst gegeben, aber das fanden unsere Mitarbeiter des Stadtarchivs gar nicht äh, lustig. Die waren irgendwie nicht so das, was sie brauchten. Ab dem zweiten Tag ist bei uns tatsächlich die Feuerwehr ins Gespräch gekommen oder die Feuerwehr ist da reingerutscht und wir haben dann ähm, die Leute tatsächlich erstmal unterstützt, haben mal Entlastungsgespräche angeboten, haben auf einem Peer-to-Peer-System versucht, mit den Leuten zu reden, haben ihnen ähm, dann auch erklärt, was passiert tatsächlich gerade mit euch, warum ist das Ganze so, ähm, haben dann auch eine Struktur mit den Leuten wieder aufgebaut. Wir haben ihnen auch da mal ganz einfache Dinge erklärt, wie setzt euch zu fünf oder baut, macht Fünfergruppen, einer muss das sagen haben, der dann noch tatsächlich sagt, was passiert. Das ist für Mitarbeiter eines Stadtarchivs, bei uns war das total ungewohnt, weil die sind es gewohnt, selbstständig zu arbeiten, selbstständig Entscheidungen zu treffen und auch das, was sie machen, in Eigenregie zu machen. Und jetzt kriegen sie auf einmal jemand hin, der ihnen sagt, hey, mach das und du machst bitte nur das. Das ist wichtig, damit die Leute dann auch wirklich in dieser Struktur Halt finden, damit sie Sicherheit darin finden. Das hat bei unserem, Stadt, bei unserem 
ähm, Einschutz tatsächlich gut funktioniert. Und wir haben das auch über eine ganze Zeit lang mit den Mitarbeitern gemacht und haben dann zu einer späteren Zeit, ein zweiter, zu einer späteren Zeit an die Firma Human Protect übergeben. Das ist dann eine, eine Firma, die sich Therapeuten beschäftigt, die sich dann um die Mitarbeiter Stutterschiefs gekümmert haben. Ein Therapeut in der Anfangsphase macht wenig Sinn, weil es geht in der Anfangsphase nur darum, die Leute wirklich zu entlasten. Dafür haben wir für den Kölner Bereich unser PSU-Team, was dann tatsächlich in diesem Bereich auch sehr gut funktioniert hat und die Leute wirklich gut unterstützt hat. Und wenn man ihnen, manchmal reicht es, dass man ihnen erklärt, hör mal, wenn du morgen früh, ich weiß, wie du deinen Fleischwurst auf dein Brot kriegst, ist das in Ordnung, das geht auch wieder weg, das ist alles normal. Und das reicht in der Anfangsphase voll und ganz aus. Zum späteren Zeitpunkt braucht man dann tatsächlich therapeutische Unterstützung. Und wir sagen so ungefähr nach fünf, sechs Wochen würden wir mit einer therapeutischen Unterstützung tatsächlich erst anfangen. Weiter. Das war ein kurzer Einblick in die Psychotraumatologie in diesem Bereich. Ähm, eigentlich viel zu kurz, müsste deutlich länger sein, um das alles zu verstehen. Danke für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit und ich wünsche Ihnen einen schönen Abend, einen schönen Tag. Danke, Thomas. Bitte. Danke. So, I am going to stop sharing the screen. Thank you, all the speakers. And I'm going to turn over to Savive um, for, we only have a few minutes left if there's anything in uh, Q&A or chat. Thank you, speakers. Uh, thank you, Shin. Um... There was on a question uh, where somebody was asking if we we'll provide e certificates, you know, for this. Um, I haven't seen any other questions, you know, besides that. Um, it's just the comments. Uh, there is a comment from Karen to saying having this psychological, you know, information is really helpful. Uh, it dovetails so nicely after hearing about the strategies we've heard from the other speakers about seeking out and accepting help from management, volunteers, etc. So basically, uh, there are no speakers, I mean, there are no questions for now. Um, so colleagues, uh, the Q&A is open now. If there are any questions, please ask. Um, perhaps I can, I can just ask, you know, a question of my own. Um, to to Marilia, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, uh, Miss Bonas. So uh, we we heard you talking about, of course, the the fire at your own museum, uh, but also at the National, you know, Museum of Brazil or Brazil National Museum, as it were. So what is what is the cause of these fires? Are they man-made or are they natural? Has there been any investigation that has been done to find out as to what the cause of these fires is? In the Museum of Portuguese language, it was uh, really, they were changing a lamp. And then in there was like a, a tiny spark that that started the fire in the scenography that was like a textile uh, material in the exhibition and it spread really quickly and in the national museum in rio de janeiro they are investigating but it was also probably like electrical problem with the electrical system and uh, rio de janeiro is really hot and it was a historical building also and so all the electrical system was was really really old and not prepared to receive like air conditioning or a lot of computers or lightning or mm -hmm. lighting like the structure so i think that the the main fires in brazil and recently we had also a huge fire in a deposit of uh, uh, a cinematic here that 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 preserves movies and I don't know images and photos and each one of these fires probably the main cause was like electrical damage of a 
spark or something like that in historical buildings because it's too expensive to make to to change the electrical structure we has all we, we have also some some difficulties because some a lot of them are historical buildings so you have to to be authorized to make this with the specialized teams and then we don't have enough money to to make this kind of of adaptation of all mm -hmm. the electrical structure and so it's really unfortunately it's really the main cause of these of these fires here in brazil mm -hmm. okay no uh, thank you so much um Jean, i'm not sure if we can you know continue with the questions because i still have a few but you know i see the time is is up it's it's half past now yeah, I think uh, because we book the Zoom time on a shared account, we should yeah. end in time. Uh, I would turn over Sylvie for you to thank the speakers and close us. Okay. Um, thank you so much, uh, colleagues. Given that you know we don't have you know a lot of time, um, I will not you know uh, have a long you know uh, thanks to make. Uh, but I just want to to thank you know the speakers um, for having shared you know with us their perspectives and, and their experiences on the issue of disasters. Um, th this is not an issue we you know always you know we always take it for granted. We we don't really take it serious you know as the heritage institutions um, because we always think that it will never happen to us. Um, and, and also for sharing, you know, how you responded, you know, to such disasters. I heard you talking about, you know, saying timeliness. All of you actually had the same message to say timely, timeliness is, is very key. Um, and uh, th there is a tendency that we, we tend to see, you know, pictures of buildings and everything and not thinking about the stuff behind, you know, those disasters that are actually affected. And I thought that, you know, the other presentation that talked to the social, psychosocial issues, it, it, it actually, you know, covered that well. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much also to the audience. You know, you were a very good audience. Without you, we would not have, you know, had this webinar. And uh, to the organizers, uh, Jean, I thought you, you did quite well, Jean, sorry. Um, and also Reggie, uh, thank you so much. And... Uh, you kind of gave me, you know, guidance in, uh, in how to do this. So yeah, thank you so much. It was my first time. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy, you know, to have been part of this. And uh, thank you so much to all the colleagues in the ARL team. Um, we really appreciate you, you know, for having assisted us here and there and also for, you know, um, suggesting some speakers, you know, in some cases. Yeah, so yeah, thank you so much. And uh, goodbye and good evening, good day, um, good morning to all of you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, speakers, and good luck to you all. I'm going to end the recording and, uh, and bid you goodbye. <laughs>